In the early hours of January 24th, 1978, people saw something strange fall out of the sky. No one knew exactly what it was or where it came from, but they can tell something was up. Am I going to see my kids again? Am I going to see my mom and dad? I'm Denizen Ake Kong. This is Operation Morning Light, a new eight-part series. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Sitting right next to the main highway through Gilmer, Texas, is an old cinder block building nestled in a leafy stand of hardwood trees. The building used to be a cafe, but it shut down a long time ago, probably before most of us were even born. Now Don Holman, a former suspect in the disappearance of Kelly Wilson, lives in that same old cafe with his stepson, Raymond. This summer, I pulled up there on a hot and sticky afternoon. Don was outside, rifling through the trunk of his car, He lifted up a couple of grocery bags from Dollar General. Need a hand? No, I think I've got it okay. Okay. You want a cookie? Uh, Yeah, I'll take a cookie. Let me get in there and we'll have a cookie. Yes, sir. You look like you... You know, I don't say say no thanks to too many cookies. (laughs) Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Folks who knew Don pretty well say he's never been able to move on from the Kelly Wilson case. If you get him started, it's all he talks about. I mean, he was falsely accused of kidnapping and killing a girl in a satanic ritual in the woods outside of town, which is the kind of stigma that's hard to shake. Gilmer residents who knew Don all their life, people who should have known better, really believed he was capable of killing Kelly, of killing and eating babies. That's got to take a toll. Don and I had been talking for a while. I want to show you something if you don't mind me showing. Sure. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to show you this stuff. He led me down a hallway in his house to a bedroom filled with papers. About the crack or I want to show you some of the stuff that I've done through the years. That's my stuff. All about the case? Yep. Huh. What do you think that is? Files, paperwork, my pa- all about the case. case. You see this right here? That's full of papers. Wow. Now, if I had done something wrong, I'd be going, I'm getting the shit out of here. I'm <laughs> burning everything. I'm Hide going to Florida. But yeah. that ain't the way I feel. I, want, mm. I don't want revenge. I want, what do you call it? Justice? Justice, but... Uh, what old Doc Holliday said, you know, he goes, no, let's get it right. He said he doesn't, he doesn't want justice, he wants reparation or something. Oh, well, there's retribution. Ret- yeah. I want them to have to, I want them to say, if a guy said, Don, listen, I'm sorry. I ain't wanting to hurt him, but, but if you're sorry, then you tell him I thought he was guilty and... And, and I'm sorry for it. Don't I need some justice after talking and, and writing all this stuff? I need some justice. But it don't mean I'm going to get justice. Don's ex, remember, her name is Tammy, was also wrongly accused of being in the Gilmer Devil Cult. She says Don's obsession with justice, or an apology at the very least, is ultimately what drove a wedge between them. Me and Don just kind of grew apart, and, you know, Don dealt with all the stuff one way. Don didn't drink, Don didn't do any of that stuff, ever. But he started drinking, and to me, out of everybody, it affected Don the worst. I mean, to me, it's made him crazy. (laughs) He would not quit talking about it for at least 10 years. That's why I quit hanging out and talking to him, because that's all he wants. I'm like, Don, it's time to move on. It's not going to change. We're not going to get any money out of it, for sure. And you just got to start living life and dealing with what God gave us to deal with, you know, and be happy that we're not in prison. I mean, that's, I mean, for real, you know, we could be dead right now or on death row. 
that's that's serious. That I see all these innocent people going through that crap around the same era. And I'm like, wow, we got off by the skin of our teeth. It was more of a miracle than I even realized. Despite their differences, Don and Tammy have remained friends. We're still cordial. I've got three other kids since, you know, I got remarried and, and I bring my kids over. He's met my kids and we talk and we get along okay. We're not, we're not enemies or anything. I know right now that if I needed something, Don would give it to me. I could ask him and he would help me. If he's sick or I try to call him on his birthday, say hey. If it don't take long for him to get on my nerves and I'm like, okay, I'm out. I keep telling people he wouldn't like this when I was mean, was he? <laughs> Please tell me he's gotten worse. Tammy has been more lucky putting some emotional distance between herself and the Kelly Wilson ordeal. But just like Dawn, she can't move on. She'd like to. She wants to put it all behind her. That's not how the world works. After all that mess happened, I got remarried and I just ran off and made myself forget about all that crap. And then the craziest thing is after I get a divorce, which was 10 years ago, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be for me to even, I can't even get a job, you know, a decent job. Every time I get a decent job, they go do a background check on me and I don't get it. I know for a fact it's because of this. I don't even have a car. I haven't had a car in 10 years. I mean, I have to walk to work. I have to get a job close enough to my house just to walk to work and back. It's because I can't afford nothing. I can't go to a doctor because I don't have no money for a doctor. I've had nice job opportunities and they'll say, well, we're going to go do a background check and never hear from them. This is crazy. This should not even be on my record because I'm struggling now just to barely make it. I had a great opportunity to go uh, work in a cafeteria at the school. I mean, to me, that was a great job. You know what I mean? I, I would love to be at work in a cafeteria at a school. There was one where they wanted me to take care of a bunch of elderly people at an old folks home. That was a great opportunity. Got turned down on that. Anyway, I, I quit trying. I mean, I don't even... The only jobs I can get are kid jobs, <laughs> you know what I mean, like McDonald's. <laughs> I can get a job at any fast food restaurant, but I can't get a job anywhere else. Yeah, I'm a cook at a gas station right now. Yeah. And it's just miserable. I just, you know, I want, a, I want a decent job where I can live. I, mean, I can't even take care of myself right now. And it's not right. Basically, like, I'm never going to get this off my back. But no one has had a tougher time than Raymond. He was a little boy when his foster parent coerced him into accusing his own mom and stepdad of sacrificing Kelly Wilson to the devil. Raymond's the one you want to talk to about all the, I mean, he's got the story. Maybe I'll give Raymond your number. And let me tell you, Raymond, that poor baby, I'm not saying he's crazy, but you can tell this is affecting him. One time I was going down the old 300. That's a highway in Gilmer. And he busted out crying. He said, I'm, I'm so sorry. He said, Don, I'm so sorry that I said something about you. But he said, they were hurting me. I said, Raymond, I'm not mad at you. I'm very proud of you. He said, well, they were hurting me. He said, they told me that y'all was in, not in jail. Y'all was with Luther and that y'all didn't even care nothing about him. And I, I said, no, that's not true, Raymond. We was in jail. And he said, I didn't know that, though. That and had I, been so traumatizing. It was. And, and Matt, if you want to get him riled up, you uh, if he gets talking about it, I have to quiet him down. I don't mean he's going to throw stuff and everything, but he said, He'll, he'll get mad. He says, son of a bitch. He said, yeah, what did they do to me over there? They left me over there and getting uh, abused and everything. That ain't right, and, and they ain't going to do nothing for nobody, you know. And uh, Where is he? He uh, went probably off with his brother uh, fishing. But if you get him to talking now, he's going to be 
pretty radical. I'm trying to tell him, say, Raymond, now don't go ape shit, but just because he, he, he's not a mean guy. I mean, look at this house. He painted this house for me. Hmm. And he could put down flooring and everything. I mean, you look over there, look at that. He painted yeah. the ceiling and everything. But hmm. when he goes into one of them rages, he, you think sometimes he's really for everybody else, and he's kind of mad at the same people we are. Who wouldn't be mad? The next time I came by Don's place, Raymond was home. He seemed pretty guarded at first. Honestly, I'm be honest with you, I didn't even want to talk with you. Like, I really didn't. Uh, Don asked me the other day, he kind of got upset because I told him, he said, hey, he wants to come talk with you. I told him, I don't have anything to say to him. Then Raymond started talking, and he couldn't stop. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Wes Ferguson. This is Devil Town. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. Good evening. Something scary happened yesterday. Something science fiction buffs have been telling us for years was going to happen. In the early hours of January 24th, 1978, people saw something strange fall out of the sky. No one knew exactly what it was or where it came from, but they can tell something was up. They said, well, we'd like your help on something. This is very confidential. You can't talk to anybody about it. Am I going to see my kids again? Am I going to see my mom and dad? I'm Denizen Ake Kong, and this is the untold story of what really happened back in 1978 and how that light in the sky is still impacting my home and my people 44 years later. This is Operation Morning Light, a new eight-part series from Imperative Entertainment in Vespucci. Follow and listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is Chapter 7, The Wreckage. To understand what happened in Gilmer, you need to understand that all this was going on right in the middle of the Satanic Panic, a time when fear of devil cults was sweeping the United States. It was basically a national witch hunt in the 80s and 90s, thousands of lurid cases from coast to coast of so-called Satanic ritual abuse. And the crazy thing is, there was almost no evidence for any of it. It took three factors coming together to create the perfect Satan storm. For one thing, people were finally taking child abuse seriously. Child abuse was a real problem that had been ignored far too long. Second was a revival in evangelical beliefs with a big emphasis on the devil. He wasn't just a metaphor for the dark side of human nature. Satan was real, and if you let your guard down, he was coming for you. I remember when I was a little kid, A traveling expert gave a talk at our Baptist church. The next thing I knew, my He-Man toys were gone, and I couldn't watch the Care Bears anymore. Those were the devil's playthings. The third factor fueling the satanic panic was a controversial practice of psychotherapy called recovered memory therapy. The idea behind recovered memories was that you might have experienced something so traumatic, your brain won't even let you think about it. You push it down leave it buried in the recesses of your subconscious. To deal with these awful memories, you have to dredge them up. 
Back in 94, after all the charges in the Kelly Wilson case were dropped, the Texas Attorney General's office brought in a child psychiatrist named Bruce D. Perry. His job, sort through the mess and try to figure out which of the Kerr kids and Raymond had actually been abused and which hadn't. It wasn't so easy. And that leads us back to holding therapy and Raymond. Despite all the courtroom drama that had occurred with the release of the eight suspects, including James York Brown and Raymond's mom, Tammy, and his stepdad, Don, Raymond was still with his foster mom, Barbara Bass. She must have truly believed she was helping Raymond to recover traumatic memories every time she held him down and dug her knuckles into his ribs until he told her what she wanted to hear. The experience left Raymond so scarred, he was afraid to go around grown-ups at all. Then Barbara Bass drove him to Dallas to meet with Dr. Perry, the child psychiatrist. I didn't trust Bruce Perry at first. All adults in my mind were out to get me. I was like, you can't trust any of these people. Like, they're all going to try to hurt us. They're lying. They're all like, something's wrong with them. They're, they're talking about killing people and eating them and devils and just like everything that I was scared of. Raymond didn't really have anything to say to Dr. Perry. So they sat down and colored together. Days later, Dr. Perry showed up at the Bass's place in East Texas. Bruce would come by the house. He got to where he wouldn't call me to his office to talk. And he would come out there to the Bass home and visit with me. Well, he would always be like on a special occasion. He'd always bring me something like a pair of boxing gloves basketball or baseball and a glove and a mitt, you know, play catch. He would never ask me questions about my parents and stuff like that. It was just on a, you know, hey man, I came by to see you. How are you doing today? So it took a while, but he told me, he said, Raymond, he said, when I met you, he said, I knew that you didn't trust. He said, I knew that you were scared of adults and didn't trust adults. He said, I didn't know why, because he didn't know I was being abused by Barbara Bass at first. But he said, then I started seeing how Barbara acted when I was at the home. He said, I'd see her in my office. I seen how she presented herself with the kids, you know, y'all. He said, but then when I'd pop up in on y'all at the house, he said, I seen how the other kids were reacting to her, how they reacted to me. Barbara had the Kerr kids and Raymond so trained up, they would spout off the answers they thought adults wanted to hear. Dr. Perry came up with a clever way to get to the truth. And uh, he basically tricked me. And what he did is he brought a device that was a, it was a heart monitor. It was like a vest and it had a watch. And he would wear the watch and it would tell my heart rate. And uh, he knew when I got nervous about things, because my, my heart rate going up and down and stuff. With Raymond wearing a heart monitor, Dr. Perry asked him questions about Kelly Wilson and the abuse allegations. As Raymond launched into the gruesome story he thought Dr. Perry wanted to hear, his heart rate stayed the same. He wasn't traumatized at all. Then Dr. Perry asked Raymond about Barbara Bass, holding him down and rubbing his ribs. That's when Raymond's heart rate spiked. That's what had traumatized him, not a fanciful story about sacrificing babies. That was the day that I had told him that Barbara Bass, you know, about the holding technique and what she had been doing. Because until then, I hadn't told all these other doctors. And, you know, I'd only told those foster parents that I, my first foster parents and Ann Gore. They were the only people that I had told that Barbara Bass was doing this. So it won't like, like when they, you know, the Basses would take us out with somebody else. I wouldn't tell them like, hey, man, this lady's like, all us kids are getting like messed up by this lady. Like, you know, like, because I didn't know who was with who. Like, and I was, I was terrified of Barbara Bass. Like, uh... I still don't like wearing seat belts. I don't like hugs. I don't like things around my rib cage. Like, but Bruce Perry, uh, he ended up being like somebody I hold high regards, like in my mind, as far as respect, because he, uh, pretty much, he's the reason that we got out of that home. Dr. Perry decided that Raymond needed a change of scenery. The whole time he'd been living in Barbara Bass's house, Raymond had been with his little brother, Luther. That was one of the last things my mom had told me. She said, you know, you take care of your baby brother. Like, and so when I was at the Bass home, 
I was real overprotective over him because he was still a baby. And so when the other kids would go to pick on him or wouldn't, you know, let him have his way, I was always, you know, there like real defensive over him. And then uh, one day they they ended up, they separated us. They, they took us to Tyler to go see my mom. At that point, I wasn't allowed to see Don anymore. And then uh, they told Barbara Bass they were taking all us kids to like Burger King. And then uh, they, they took me and drove me out to Waco, Texas. Raymond was taken to a Methodist children's home in Waco. I met a kid there and he told me, he said, Raymond, he said, I don't know what all you've been through, you know, he said, but uh, once you get to this home, you don't get to go home. Like, you know, like everybody here, like we don't get to see our parents no more. Like, you know, we're here till we're 18 or we get adopted or something. Believing he had no chance of being reunited with his mom, stepdad, and baby brother, Raymond lost hope. He started getting in trouble. His caregivers sent him down the hill to a facility for the bad kids. And when I was down in the, down that hill, they had, that was like for all the troublemakers in that home. And I was the youngest one down there. They were all like 16, 17, most of them, because they were the bad kids, you know? And uh, so I picked up a lot of bad habits from those kids. They're huffing glue and all kinds of crazy stuff. Raymond was just eight years old, and probably he struck up a friendship with a boy of 16, and that kid had a plan to break out. You know, he was like, look, he said, when we go to school, he said, uh, act up in school. And he said, they're going to send us back here to our dorm rooms. He said, when they bring us the lunch, he said, we're going to take our food and put it in bags. And he said, we're already going to have our clothes packed up. And he said, I know how to get us out of here. He threw that fire extinguisher through the window and we ran out and hid from them. It was a big property and uh, we ran into the night, you know, it got dark and uh, I think finally like a security guard spotlighted me. I was along the fence line and I couldn't climb the chain link fence. Like I was eight years old, you know? And uh, the kid I was with jumped the border fence and took off. They ended up catching him like an hour or two later. After Raymond's ill-fated escape attempt, he was sent to another place, a boy's ranch. Raymond had spent two years in foster care. One day, an associate of Raymond's old friend, Dr. Bruce Perry, the child psychiatrist, came to visit Raymond at the ranch. Bill Baker came to see me one day, and he said, Raymond, you want to come take a walk with me? And I said, yeah. And uh, I started walking with him, and we were talking. They out there, they had ponds and stuff. And uh, he stopped over there by the pond, and he looked at me and said, Raymond, I want to ask you something. He said, I'm serious. And I said, what? He said, you want to go home to your mama? And I remember I started crying. I was like, yeah, I want to go home. And uh, it took about a week or two later, and they they drove me here to the Yamboree grounds here in Gilmer and dropped me off with my mom. They were like, here you go. like. And like all my aunts and uncles were there. That was the first time I'd seen them in years. So I was like, it was just like real exciting. And then uh, and then later on that night, I got to, you know, we stopped by here and Luther and Don were here at the house. Like, Don's mother was here. Like, so that was like a, a, a it was a good day. I got uh, Luther back first. And then Raymond was like six months later, I guess. And they bought him a bedroom suit apiece. And that was it. Sorry, we screwed up your kids. Our bad. We screwed your kids up. Here you go. Figure it out. You won't be able to get a job anywhere. You won't be able to do anything with your life. But here you go. Although Don was there to greet Raymond on the day he got out of foster care, Don and Tammy were no longer a couple. The family Raymond remembered was no more. Like, even after all this was over, it really wasn't over because when I came home, my mom and Don had already split up. Me and my mom bounced around. So, 
just gave me a different outlook on things. Put me on like a don't trust authority type thing. When I was in school, I remember when I came home, the day I came home, I can remember like telling myself, I don't care whatever happens from this day forward because by the time I came home, I never thought I was going to see them again. So when they brought me home, that was like, it was like the best day, you know what I mean? Like, in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't care what, if I never achieve a goal in my life or graduate high school or, you know, things that when you're a kid, like, that's what in your mind, you're like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be this. I felt like all my prayers and minutes, I got to come home. But it really won't like coming home. You think you're going right back to your home. And I didn't. You know, Don, Don took custody of Luther. My mom had custody of me. We were all together, but we won't together. And I remember like having to carry that guilt with me for a while, which I already had feeling like I broke my family apart and going through all this. Despite their reassurances, Raymond couldn't shake the feeling that Don and Tammy resented him for his role in their arrests. They were sitting there in jail. I'm sure they were probably sitting there at times and were thinking, what in the hell is Raymond talking about? Why would he, why would his little ass be out there fucking lying on us? Like, because that's how I would feel. It gives you a different, uh, perspective of it, I guess. I just think that every kid in your shoes would have done the same thing. I think that's just, I mean, it has happened again and again. You know, if you coerce, torture, you know, a kid, the kids, eventually just every kid is going to tell the adult what they want to hear, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's not It's not you, it's, it's all children. Yeah, and adults too. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, adults, when they were waterboarding them guys over there at uh, Tonomo Bay, when they were over there waterboarding them uh, Muslims, not all that intel is uh, viable. Like, they know that. Like, so, like, it gives you a different view on things. Like I said, it's just a big trust issue thing. So from seven years old, my head's been full of devil worshiping, killers, cannibalism, sexual misconduct. I was submerged in that type of atmosphere. People, they just want to go off and tell off what they hear. So trust is uh, like a big issue with me because I had trust broken at a very early age and I seen how the system could be corrupt. And I think, you know, like sometimes I think about it and I'm like, what if Barbara Bass really did have good intentions? Even though I was there firsthand and seen the fucked up side of it, but I, like in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it was just something that kind of like, you know, one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. It was this chain of events. And when he first came home from foster care, he had a love for her. I don't know if they call it stock syndrome. That's Raymond's mom, Tammy, talking about his conflicted feelings for Barbara Bass. Stockholm syndrome is where hostages form emotional bonds with their captors. You know, I get so angry, <laughs> you know. But I knew it wasn't his fault, so I just, I don't know how long it took me, it took him to get over that, but, you know, maybe a year or so, he got, you know, a hatred of, of them started coming out little by little. And then part of me goes, well, what if it was all like some kind of big scam? You think about every scenario. When there's a question mark and you don't know the answer, you start putting anything in there for an answer to see what fits. Affects everything, I'm, uh, uh, the way I interact with uh, people, just everything, I'm, it really, it's affected my life a lot. I don't, I don't care for strangers. I like, I like being around big like crowds. I didn't finish high school. Driving down the street, going to work, somebody on the side of the street stranded. I don't want to stop. I don't want to be that person to involve myself. I want to stop. I want to pull over and get out and say, hey man, are y'all all right? Y'all need to use a cell phone. You need some waters I got back here in the truck. Uh, can I give you a ride into town? But I never stop for them because I don't want to be involved in 
anybody, you know, that's outside of my circle. I left my conversation with Raymond feeling just so sad. He's a broken man. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast, wherever you listen. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore, but Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. When all the charges were dropped in the Kelly Wilson case, folks in Gilmer were left to sort through the wreckage. Scott Lyford went back to private practice. Caseworkers Ann Gore and Debbie Minshew resigned from CPS. Connie Martin, the one-time witness, moved down to Special Investigator Brooks Flagg's Christian Retreat in Louisiana, this place called the Shepherd's Rest. A local news reporter tracked down Connie at the Shepherd's Rest, and East Texans were in for yet another shock. Martin asked to be interviewed without flag present. She said she had something important to say. I'll just come out and tell you like it is because the Kelly Wilson thing is not true. Martin says she was coerced into confessing to taking part in Kelly Wilson's murder and tricked into leveling murder accusations against other family members and friends, along with Gilmer Police Sergeant James Brown. They just practically tell me what was said. And I would say that it didn't happen. They'd say, yes, it did. And I would say, no, it didn't. And they'd keep pressuring me and saying, no, uh, I know it did happen. Brooks Flagg had a lot to worry about, as did the other members of the special prosecutor's team. Shane Phelps, the assistant attorney general for the state of Texas, was threatening to turn the tables and file criminal charges against them. Here's Shane. And, and ultimately, I, I subpoenaed all of them to the grand jury and told them that they were targets of the grand jury because I was seriously contemplating indicting them for official oppression because it was so wrong what they did. So why didn't you indict them? (sighs) Because this had been, this whole satanic nonsense had been such a distraction that nobody was devoting any resources to finding Kelly Wilson. It, It was nobody. I knew that if I had indicted them, and I could have indicted them, and I could have convicted them, There's no question in my mind that if I had done that, then that would have been the story. That's what people would have been talking about. That's where all of our resources would have been devoted. And I I didn't want that. I wanted to see if we could find Kelly Wilson and get some answers for for the parents. So I I made the decision not to. I've gone back and forth over the years because it was so outrageous. Um, It would have been a good thing for, I think, everything to have been aired in court so the public could have seen what an aberration this investigation was. And they would have been as angry as I was because we could have put experts on the stand about interrogation techniques and there's not a single person with any kind of expertise in police interrogation tactics who would not have said that was so far beyond acceptable. The Lifer team had narrowly avoided criminal prosecution. James Brown tried a different tack. Just two months after the charges against Sergeant Brown were dropped, he filed a civil lawsuit against Special Prosecutor Scott Lyford and the members of the team alleging malicious prosecution 
James Brown told the news media that Gilmer residents were shunning him in the streets. His reputation was destroyed. I always thought James was sort of a black and white kind of kind of guy, but not a whole lot of gray. Uh, I, th I think he feels betrayed by by the justice system. Not not only with what happened with the accusation, but then what happened when he tried to go uh, redress what had happened uh, in his civil lawsuit. This is James Brown's attorney, David Moore. When the charges were dismissed, um, we filed, along with Andy Tindall, lawyer over in Tyler, um, a civil rights lawsuit against Lyford, Lyford's law firm, Bags Flag, Gore, Minshew, and the court reached the decision that because the flags and bag were acting under the color of law enforcement, that they had qualified immunity, as did Gore and Minshew, and uh, poured us out in federal court, saying that, that we couldn't get over the qualified immunity hump. I, I think we did. You know, I disagree with the judge's decision in that deal, but um, yeah, it's just, it's just a shame. Just a shame. Here's James Brown. Nothing can be done to them. So they're wrongdoings. Being held accountable, they slip through the cracks. You know, so it's like opening Pandora's box on the justice system if they are held accountable. And they don't want to do that. And that's the sad part about it. And uh, my feelings are, you know, like I said, they, they should have done something to those people. But the way the system is set up, they have immunity to certain things. You know, no matter if they lie or falsify stuff or hurt people, they don't care. And they go on about their little lives. And I don't believe that that's the way the justice system was set up to be. I believe that you tell the truth and the truth is the truth. And, I, and I've always believed that. How big of a problem is qualified immunity in protecting bad actors? I think it's a huge problem, and I, you know, you, you see a lot of discussion about um, on the federal level of removing that qualified immunity that that cops have to lawsuits. One thing that really shocked me talking to the boy who was um, sub subjected to the holding technique, uh, Raymond, his mom Tammy said, so she. Um, 30 years later, still can't get a decent job. Can't afford a car. She walks from her apartment where she you know, rents a room to the nearest gas station and just runs the deep fryer every day. Um, and she, you know, every time she applies for a job, like even to be a lunch lady at the school, mm -hmm. is saying like, oh, you're great. You know, like, we can't wait to work with you. We just have to run the background check. And then they run the background check. They find out that she has these child molestation charges right. and she never hears another word from them. Right. So it's really, I mean, it's just ruined her life for decades. Right. Right. It's a stigma that you can't get past. I mean, is there anything that can be done for these people at this point? Um, I tell you what, next time you talk to her, have her call me. I'll be glad to talk to her and see. If there's something we can do to help her, because that ought not be a cloud still following her 30 years later. I passed along David's message to Tammy. When she called his law firm, she was told it would cost $6,000 to clear her record. So she'll keep walking to work at the gas station. Some folks are just too poor for justice. As for Kelly Wilson, missing since January 5th, 1992, She's still out there. It bugs me 30 years later what happened. It bugs me for James's sake and his family. It bugs me for, for Kelly's sake and her family. Because I think, I think that they damaged what should have been a real investigation into her disappearance. And I think it got sidetracked 
for years as a result of what these what these guys and gals did. And it's just, it's a shame. It's a shame. Sergeant Brown never returned to the Gilmer police force. His days as a cop were done. He eventually found work as a prison guard. His wife, Penny, had stood by his side when he was accused of kidnapping and murdering Kelly Wilson. But the legal ordeal changed him. Here's Penny. Well, it pretty much um, made him feel uh, insecure, um, angry. He was a nervous wreck. I think he felt lost. You know, it's just terrible. He was on medication, antidepressants. He saw a psychiatrist, and we both saw a counselor together to try to deal with all the emotion of what had happened and how it was affecting us. He was on a lot of medication, and then he had that, uh, that mini stroke. Several years after the charges were dropped, James and Penny Brown got divorced. And as I learned from poking around Gilmer, a lot of East Texans still believe he's guilty. That's the bad part about it all. You know, sometimes people want to believe a lie than that they do the truth, because the truth isn't near as fantastic. I think it's still like that to this day. Yeah, they'd rather believe a lie than to believe the truth. I mean, you know, that's the reason I just get to the point of not wanting to even talk about it because it's not about me. It's about Robbie and his daughter finding her. Despite all he's been through and all the time that's gone by, James Brown still believes Kelly Wilson will be found. He believes that someday Kelly's parents will have closure. There's several suspects that are still open. And not everything lies at one door until you find the final key. You know, that's that's more or less subjective investigation. You don't draw a conclusion to one person until you know for a fact that person is the person. You know, they say nowadays there's persons of interest. Well, in this case, there's several of them. The case of a missing girl got lost in all the hysteria. Kelly is still out there, somewhere. With the satanic panic, a distant memory, I want to know what really happened to Kelly Wilson. Devil Town is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and created by me, Wes Ferguson. Executive producer is Jason Hoke. Audio engineering and editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. Original score is by Robert Ellis. Recording by Austin Sisler at Eastside Studios. If you like the show, leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.